Welcome back. Everybody's still here. Everybody's still awake. Everybody's ready for, for Greg. Uh, if you had a chance to see any of the Pour la Marite film that was showing on the screen in the break, uh, Greg informs me that that is a very good lead-in to his talk. So keep that in mind. And uh, he can tell you all about that film and quite honestly all about most any World War I aviation film because I've picked his brains uh, over the years on all of them. Greg Van Weingarten, his fascination with World War I aviation goes back to his childhood. He joined the nonprofit Historical Cross and Cockade Society, that's the precursor to the League of World War I Aviation Historians, when he was 17. It was earlier than Ted, uh, who did make it to 13, but uh, Greg had his first published article in the Society's Journal in 1980. He is a charter member of the League of World War I Aviation Historians, had an article published in our very first issue, and many since then. It doesn't say it here, but he's also uh, an issue editor. Oh, it does say that. Since 1990, he's been an issue editor for the League. He was a speaker at the League's first seminar in 1988, and He's been a speaker regularly at our seminars because he's always got great information. Greg has authored 12 books on German aviators and air units for Osprey and has written four titles for Albatross. A lifelong resident of Iowa, Greg is a retired public school teacher, 37 years as a public school teacher, now devotes, yes, now devotes much of his time to writing, editing, and photo collecting. Uh, he has made presentations on the Iowa World War I Airman and author James Norman Hall at the Iowa State Historical Museum and other Iowa sites. Greg Van Weingarten. Thank you very much, Dan, and thanks to Dan and Carl for setting up and planning this marvelous seminar. And thanks to the museum for this amazing venue. It's an honor to be here. Um, as you can see, this really was intended to be a joint presentation by, by my much smarter colleague, Lance Brunnenkant, and me. And uh, it was really his idea, his concept, and uh, he did over half the work, believe me. S but sadly, at the 11th hour, uh, he, had a, he found out he had a conflict. He had a much better gig to go to, so he's in Germany today. Uh, so you're stuck with me, and I'll apologize in advance for my lousy pronunciation of French and Belgian names. Anyway, the story of the Christmas truce of 1914, when British and German soldiers met in no man's land and exchanged gifts, took photos, and even engaged in impromptu football games is widely known. Tales of downed pilots being entertained at their opponent's airfields during World War I have occasionally appeared in movies, like the one many of you just saw, and novels. But relatively few people are familiar with the actual events. Through the years, Lance and I have gathered and encountered numerous written accounts and photographs that attest to the extent to which German airmen afforded this courtesy to their opponents and we've been both surprised and inspired by how often this happened. So the goal today is to share some of the more interesting accounts and photographs to underscore the fact that this type of gentlemanly and respectful behavior did indeed occur throughout a war that was otherwise extremely cruel and deadly. Now the first account I want to share starts on the 1st of July, 1916, which I'm sure you know will, was the opening day of the Battle of the Somme. Second Lieutenant Ar Lawrence Arthur Wingfield took off in 12 Squadron's BE-2C, 4196, on a mission to bomb San Quentin's railway station. Wingfield's post-war account that Lance and I presented in Over the Front, Volume 25, Number 4, where you can read the whole thing, described how the weight of his bomb load prevented him from bringing along an observer or a gunner, so he was flying alone. He wrote, his planned escort of a flight of DH-2s never materialized, and he therefore reached the target alone. And he wrote, on the way home, I met a Fokker monoplane, and that was the end of the story. 
It took the Fokker about 15 minutes to shoot me down, but I do not think that there was at any time during the encounter any hope of my getting away from him. Turns out, he had met up with Leutnant Wilhelm Frankel of KEK Vo, who told his own story of the account in the, in the 18 April 1917 edition of Flugsport magazine. Alerted by a report that there was a plane crossing the lines alone, Frankel headed out to intercept it in his Fokker E4, and during his approach watched as it dropped its bomb on the railway station and then turned back toward the front lines. Frankel soon closed the distance and climbed above his opponent. Frankel wrote, at the final 80 to 100 meters, I dove the machine down steeply at the enemy, aimed my machine guns, pressed the trigger, then both machine guns failed to fire because of a machine gun control malfunction. My disappointment and rage were so great that I decided to continue the attack anyway. Frankel's maneuvers forced the BE-2 lower and lower until, as Frankel related, he barely jumped over some trees and landed smoothly. I flew around the enemy airplane and observed how his propeller was still rotating. Then, after a few minutes, I saw German soldiers approaching, and an Englishman arose from the machine and, and went towards our warriors with raised arms. I, too, landed and drove straight there in a motor vehicle. I reached the Englishman after a few minutes and went up to him. I was surprised. He was a very young, delicate little chap of officer's rank who wore his garrison cap at a jaunty angle over his ear. He was only 19 years old. Frankel, by the way, was an old man of 22 at this time. His face was still quite flush from excitement, and a few small tears over his lost freedom shone in the corners of his eyes. I went up to him and introduced myself, Frankel. He looked at me with a curious expression, made a somewhat childlike bow, and likewise introduced himself, Wingfield. A handshake sealed the end of any hostility between us. After a brief hour in the casino, we had to deliver Wingfield to the prisoner assembly place, where I still visit him from time to time. Isn't this an amazing photo? It's just wonderful. Many years after the fact, Wingfield provided some more of his own perspective in an interview. I looked around for a suitable place to land. I landed on a parade ground full of German troops. I entirely forgot that I ought to have done something about my plane, such as set it on fire. I was surrounded by souvenir-hungry German soldiers and was eventually rescued by four officers in a small Mercedes-Benz. I was very courteously treated by my captors, who took me back to a magnificent chateau where I was entertained to tea with the squadron. The man who shot me down, Wilhelm Frankel, was introduced to me. He told me that I was his seventh victory. After tea, I was taken around the aerodrome and allowed to have a good look around a Fokker. Now, many of you will have noticed that although Wingfield stated in his accounts that he had been shot down, Frankel maintained that both of his machine guns had failed to fire. Frankel was not credited with a victory that day, despite a captured airplane and pilot, which supports his version, because apparently German authorities evidently did not view an enemy pilot surrendering his undamaged aircraft as qualifying. Wingfield was only human, and I think we can understand and forgive his reticence after the war in not explicitly admitting that he had surrendered without a shot being fired, and then it was then treated decently by the man who had fooled him. Incidentally, this was not the first time that Frankel had visited with an opponent. Here we have a photograph of him with 2nd Lieutenant H. L. C. Akid, the pilot, and Captain C. E. H. James, the observer, the crew of 20 squadrons FE-2B 5206 that was credited as Frankel's sixth victory on 21 May 1916. Here's another view of the same two prisoners in a much more relaxed and friendly atmosphere, and Frankel is standing behind them. Now, next example. On the early morning of 15 April 1917, 
four pilots of German Yass the 17 took off in search of French opponents. Two of them were the most promising pilots in the unit. One was Julius Buckler, a rising star with three victories already to his credit and a future Blue Max winner. The other was his best friend and frequent wingman, Georg Strasser, who had two French victims up to this point. Like Buckler, Strasser would survive the war with seven confirmed victories of his own. They were all flying Albatross D3s, with Buckler's machine displaying his usual name, Mops, on the fuselage, as did all of his fighter planes. Buckler wrote, We took off after dawn with four machines. After ten minutes, we'd been scattered to the winds, and I flew west to the rising sun behind me. Since nothing was going on at the front, I soon turned back again. Then two machines came towards me that were flying at almost the same altitude. I cautiously turned away to one side until I recognized Strasser and made up my mind to join the two of them. This decision saved Strasser's life. I thought I was dreaming when I got a closer look at the machine flying behind and somewhat lower than Strasser, for it had red, white, and blue cockades. A detail Buckler did not see was that the French Spad also displayed the stork emblem of Escadrille III, the famous elite unit to which Guinemer and many other aces belonged. Back to, uh, to Buckler's quote. The Frenchman must have been stalking him unnoticed and was now waiting for the favorable moment to strike, so there was no time to lose. I charged at the lower aircraft and opened fire, but without success. A jam forced me to break off from him. You're going to see kind of a pattern emerging here. It was at this critical moment that Strasser pounced on him from above. The Frenchman went into a dive with Strasser and myself behind him. I was enraged to discover that despite all my frantic efforts, the jam could not be cleared in the air. In the meantime, the Frenchman had managed, in an incredibly skillful maneuver, to get above Strasser and now almost sat on his neck. Apparently, Strasser also had a jam, as he made a run for it and the Frenchman followed him, oddly enough, without firing. Could he also have a jam? I wanted to find out, and disregarding the fact that I could not shoot, went after him. The Frenchman turned to look at me, and when he saw I was getting a setting a determined course for him, he became nervous, side-slipped, regained control of the machine just above the ground, and prepared for a landing, during which he flipped over. Strasser also landed, and a minute later my machine was standing next to the other two. This took place about six kilometers behind the front. The prisoner was a nice young fellow, a sergeant and a real Frenchman. His name, and I've been told by some of my French friends, it's probably pronounced Papille, that's the way I'm going to pronounce it, was truly thankful that my bullets had mostly missed their mark. His name was Papille. It was my greatest victory, and there is no other that I can think of with such joy. Why had Papille landed? A grazing wound on his cheek alone could not be the cause of it, but now it was revealed that he had, in fact, also been the victim of a jammed machine gun, and that during the flight we had both been bluffing in the same way. However, I had the better nerves. Besides that, I, I had put two bullets through his fuel tank, and that was the compelling reason for his landing. Louis Papiel was 26 years old, having transferred to aviation from the artillery in 1915. He had joined Escadrille III in early 1917 and had been credited with two victories. This poor quality but unique photo shows Strasser and Papiel with the bandage on his cheek, Leutnant Gross, Leutnant Traeger, and Buckler on the far left. While the Yasta 17 pilots were taking the French pilot to their quarters in a car, Strasser told Buckler that he insisted Buckler should receive full credit for bringing down the SPAD, even though he had also participated. Thus, the Frenchman was counted as Buckler's fourth confirmed victory, and he would gain 32 more and rise to the command of Yasta 17 by the war's end. Buckler reported, Papille behaved in every aspect like a good soldier and patriot should. One could not get a word out of him regarding military matters. 
Since he saw that we completely understood this and regarded him as a comrade, he soon became sociable and told amusing stories, of which I admittedly understood only a little, and we spent a merry evening with him in the mess. Late in the evening, we delivered him to the rear. In an unusual postscript, in September 1917, Papiel succeeded in escaping from prison camp in Dillingen, Germany, and made his way back to French territory. This plaque was presented to him by the Aero Club de France in honor of his escape. Going on to our next example. On the morning of 18 October 1917, 22 Squadron's B flight of six Bristol F-2B fighters set off to link up with a formation of bombers headed for an aerodrome outside of Ghent. One of them, A7125, was manned by Canadian pilot Lieutenant Bertram B. Perry and his observer, Second Lieutenant Clarence Bartlett. Perry authored an extensive account of their experience that was published in a 1938 edition of Popular Flying. And all of that can be read in Over the Front, Volume 29, Number 3. Perry related that his flight spotted a formation of eight beautifully colored false scouts, a type he had never seen before. A scrap ensued during which Perry's forward firing machine gun jammed. While trying to clear it, he almost collided with his intended target, whose prop wash sent Perry's Bristol fighter into a spin. A false then scored some hits, and Perry tried to evade by going into another spin. This was repeated several times until Perry had, had reached the ground, where he crashed while, trying, while banking to avoid a series of trees in front of him. He and Bartlett emerged unhurt from the wreck, but quickly saw tracer bullets ricocheting off the ground near them. They were being fired by some of the German false fighters. Whereupon, they quickly ran into the woods and were quickly taken prisoner by German soldiers. They were initially transported to a nearby chateau by some German officers and then to a Belgian cottage where they were served biscuits and coffee. Perry wrote, We had been there an hour or more when, suddenly, the door was flung open, the Germans with us sprang smartly to a salute, and three young men wearing long gray coats strode into the room. They saluted their countrymen, and then shook hands with them. The smallest of the three, which is actually an inaccurate recollection, came towards me with outstretched hand and said in English, I am Lieutenant Lovenhart. I have shot you down. Perry had met Yastatens Erich Lovenhart, who at the time had secured only six of his eventual 54 victories. Perry continued, I merely said, how do you do? and ignored his hand. He looked at me with astonishment. Oh, but you will not shake hands, he exclaimed. I don't shake hands with any man who shot at me after I was down on the ground, I declared. Oh, but I did not intend to hit you, he informed me. I was only trying to keep you away so you would not set your aeroplane on fire. He talked earnestly and with boyish eagerness as though he were trying to explain away a youthful prank. Will you not shake hands with me, he pleaded. You know, he continued wistfully, for you, the war is over. But for me, I must go on and on until maybe I am killed. I began to wonder what I would do if the situation was reversed. Finally, I shook hands with him. I told him my name and introduced him to Lieutenant Bartlett. He then introduced me to his squadron commander, Lieutenant Klein. Klein talked in English also. Both were exceedingly polite and friendly. They had come to take us to their squadron headquarters, which were located in Courtrai. They had a big Daimler car outside, and Lovenhardt assisted Bartlett and I into the back seat. He sat between us and offered cigarettes. During the drive of several miles through the peaceful country roads, Lovenhardt talked freely and in a friendly manner. We had had very little questioning since we had been captured, and we met all interrogations with, I don't know, or I cannot discuss that. Much to my surprise, the Germans seemed to accept these answers. At no time did they threaten us or attempt to bulldoze us when we bluntly evaded their questions. On the journey, Lovenhart, 
discussing some of the details of our particular combat, accused me of deliberately trying to crash into him. I assured him this was not the case, but merely my rotten flying. I don't think he had ever attempted to spin his machine, for he was profuse in complimenting me on the way I had shaken them off several times by spinning. He wanted me to explain how the controls were set. At Courtrai, we met the other members of Staffel 10. The wine was flowing freely, although I did not see any signs of drunkenness. Our hosts were somewhat surprised when we refused to imbibe more than one small glass of wine, which Lovenhart ordered brought to us. It was weak wine at that, but we had determined that our tongues were not to be loosened by liquor. I was troubled by frequent dizzy spells, and Perry had in fact suffered a concussion. And Lovenhart, who seemed extremely solicitous about me and was as attentive as a nurse, suggested that I lie down. He led the way upstairs to the room he shared with another officer. I went to sleep in Lovenhart's bed. Bartlett took the other. Now Perry wrote, woke up an hour later feeling greatly refreshed and rejoined Lovenhart, Klein, and Alois Heldman, another ace of Yasta 10. Perry recalled, when I told Lovenhart I had not encountered the false scout in the air before and knew nothing about it, he proposed that we visit his aerodrome nearby and look over the planes. Klein, Heldmann, and Lovenhart accompanied Bartlett and I. At the aerodrome, many of the mechanics and workmen had cameras and sought permission from Klein and Lovenhart to take pictures of us. We were not given much choice in the matter, although Lovenhart graciously asked me if, if, he, if we would mind posing with him beside his plane after a group picture of the five of us had been taken. We obliged. Perry then recounted how he told Lovenhart he would like to try flying a false. Lovenhart agreed, but only if the airplane had just five gallons of gasoline and no ammunition. To which Lovenhart added, but I will take up a plane and shoot you down if you try to escape. His commander Klein, hearing this remarkable exchange, put an end to the matter by dryly interjecting that such an unusual thing might lead to complications with a higher command. <laughs> Perry and Bartlett were driven back to Yasatin's quarters where they were visited by a Rittmeister that Perry dubbed Mr. Intelligence Department, in other words, an intelligence officer, who impressed Perry by naming 22 Squadron's commander even though he and Bartlett had never disclosed the identity of their unit. The Rittmeister also showed them the ring from one of their squadron mates who had been killed during that day's engagement with somebody they knew. Oops. Dinner was then served with Lovenhart explaining rather apologetically that they could not give us as good food as we'd been accustomed to, as their rations were limited. Having been confronted with the loss of a friend, Perry wrote that we were too de dejected to enter into any conversation. The German pilots seemed to understand our feelings. They had enough worries and griefs of their own, no doubt. As the meal ended, we were informed a car was waiting to take us away before darkness came. They all shook hands with us, and some wished us a pleasant sojourn in Germany. Lovenhart came out to the car with us. He told us that he would drop a message over our lines with word of what had happened to us. He shook hands with us again, and as I grasped his hand and looked at him for the last time, I told him I hoped he would come through the war safely. I meant it. He had convinced me that he was a gentleman, a good sportsman, and a worthy foe. I was genuinely sorry when I learned of his death some months later. Perry was given a scrap of paper upon which Lovenhart and Heldman had written their home addresses evidently in the optimistic hope that he might contact them after the war. A Leutnant Mann, who stayed with the captives that night and who Perry said was the head of a German intelligence staff attached to the Air Force, added his name and address to the scrap as well. Once again, this was not the only occasion where Yasta 10 entertained their captured guests. Here we see members of the unit posing with 11 squadrons, Sergeant M. H. Everix, the pilot, and Lieutenant H. Whitworth, after Adam Barth standing between them, 
brought down their Bristol fighter on 5 December 1917. And you can see Klein, Heldman, and Lovenhart right here. Okay. Our next example. On the morning of the 7th of May, 1918, three Newport 28s of the 94th Aero Squadron took off from Toul Aerodrome to intercept a group of German fighters. The Germans were from Yasta 64, a unit that had already clashed with the Hat in the Ring Squadron several times. The, the cross that the Smithsonian has that came from Allen Winslow is from a Yasta 64 airplane. The American flight leader, by far the most experienced, was Captain James Norman Hall, flying his Newport numbered 17. Hall was a veteran of the Lafayette Escadrille and the 103rd Aero Squadron, with four victories to his credit. Hall later wrote, Eddie Rickenbacker, Eddie Green, and I were on alert duty at the hangars when a phone call was received from the lines that a flight of enemy planes was in the air not far from pont a mousson I immediately left the field with Lieutenants Rickenbacker and Green. We sighted an enemy formation of five Albatross monoplace machines about six kilometers inside their lines. Our patrol was at an altitude of 4,500 meters and the enemy some 500 meters below us. We attacked at once and the enemy, being at a disadvantage, dove further into their lines. I had my hoped for victim well in my sights and went down standing on the rudder bar. Then I heard a strange cracking or ripping sound just above my head. Hall had fallen victim to the well-known structural fault of the Newport 28, which I'm sure most of you know about, a failure of the wing leading edge and the resulting loss of fabric. Glancing up quickly, I saw that the fabric was ripping back along my right upper wing. I was forced to pull up at once in line of flight and turn homeward for the lines. I had hoped that I could reach home if I nursed my plane along gently. Meanwhile, the German whom I had been attacking, seeing me leave the combat, started climbing again, pulling up and firing at me. I throttled down to the lowest speed, and by keeping my control stick to one side, I was able to keep my little ship fairly level. But I was losing altitude all the while, and was forced to fly as nearly as possible in a straight line. German anti-aircraft batteries were firing steadily at me, as if he didn't have enough trouble. And as I could not change direction, they were putting their bursts closer and closer. And Mike O'Neill's wonderful drawing here illustrates a typical Newport wing failure. Of a sudden, my plane gave a violent lurch, and I started falling out of control. I had about 1,000 meters of altitude at the time, and it doesn't take a falling plane long to cover that distance. Try as I would, I was unable to ride it again. I saw the ground coming up swiftly to meet me at various angles, and just before it did, I pulled back hard on my stick, and the happy result was that my Newport hit at not too steep an angle. The landing gear was sheared off, and the fuselage skidded along the ground right side up. At that time, I did not know the reason for the sudden fall of my plane, but supposed it was due to the bursting of the fabric on the upper wing. By sheer luck, I fell in an open field surrounded by woodland. German troops had their dugouts in the woods and came running from all sides toward my plane. When they had lifted me out, I asked one of them who spoke English to set me on my feet. But the moment I touched the ground, I knew that both of my ankles were broken and grabbed their shoulders, for the pain was severe. I was treated very decently by the soldiers who remained with me until the arrival of an officer. They carried me to a dugout near the border of the woods, and a few minutes later a medical corps orderly came. He bound up my ankles and put a dressing on my nose, which was broken. Then I was given a drink of water and a German cigarette. Now in this photo we see Hall with his bandaged nose and his bandaged ankle now also note the little dachshund held by the man at right. Soon an infantry officer arrived and asked for Hall's papers. Hall gave him his ID card and the 800 francs he was carrying. The officer kept Hall's identification card but returned his wallet and money and did not question him further. Then, Hall wrote, in about an hour's time some other officers arrived to inform me, in French and in English, that they belonged to a combat squadron 
located at Mars Latour, and that they had had the honor of fighting with me that morning. I met the man I had been diving on when the fabric burst on my upper right wing, who was Friedrich Hengst of Yasta 64, and he is right there. Here we see that Hall is now cradling the little dachshund. It was, had been handed to him. They said that my two comrades had returned safely, but as a result of the combat, one pilot of their own squadron had been shot down and killed. After the war, this victory was credited to Rickenbacker because of Hall's testimony. Hall continued, Apparently, they felt no ill will toward me on this account. On the contrary, they were very courteous and friendly and asked if I felt able to lunch with them at their aerodrome just before being taken to the hospital. I was not feeling in a company mood just then, but of course accepted the invitation. They, they went out to look at my plane. When the Germans returned, they brought with them an officer of an anti-aircraft battery in the vicinity, who was very happy because, as he said, his battery would get the credit for bringing me down. How is that? I said. You saw what happened to my plane, referring, of course, to the wing fabric. Yes, he said, but that isn't what brought you down. He then told me that in their battery they had a 37 millimeter gun which had been firing at me and that one of the shells had struck fast in my engine without exploding. I remembered then the sudden lurch my plane had given just before I started falling. So a million to one shot, his plane is, receives a direct hit from an anti-aircraft shell and the other million to one shot, it didn't explode. Nevertheless, I couldn't believe what he had told me until I was shown a photo with the engine of the shell stuck fast in it. It seemed incredible. Hall's story was indeed one of the more incredible survival stories of the war. Oddly enough, Friedrich Hanks of Yasta 64 was also given credit for Hall's downing, as it was believed that it was his attack that had forced the Newport down into the range of the anti-aircraft fire. It would be the second of Hanks' eventual five confirmed victories. Hall was driven to the airfield of Yasta 64. It was a drive of about 15 kilometers to the aerodrome of the German squadron. They were quartered in a comfortable old house in town. I was placed on a sofa. While we were waiting for lunch, one of the pilots sat down at a piano and played some French songs that were popular on that side of the lines. This is, doubtless, a part of the game, I thought, following the mellowing influence of music, then that of wine, and then, they hoped, the indiscreet disclosures. American aviators were rarities on the German side of the lines at that time, and my captors knew not only that I belonged to an American squadron with a hat and the ring insignia, but also that I'd been a pilot in the Escadrille Lafayette, for I was wearing my old flying helmet marked with that name. They were greatly interested in my Newport Type 28. First, we had a roast, then a salad, dessert, and coffee to finish with. I was relieved, of course, no wine, and amused as well. They were quieting my fears with a vengeance. I would not have objected to one glass of wine. Everything was open and above board insofar as I could judge. I was even informed in advance that an intelligence officer was coming to question me. He was a major, not at all alarming in either appearance or manner. He questioned me for some time in an easy, affable way. Hall continued. A courtesy often extended between opposing air forces was that when a pilot was shot down behind enemy lines but not killed, a message would be dropped by his captors on his own side of the lines. I gratefully accepted the offer to have this done for me. I must not forget to mention the courtesy extended to me by the pilots of this German squadron. While I was in the hospital, they brought me a snapshot of my Newport just as it fell showing the tattered fabric hanging down from my upper wing, and the engine spilled out in front. I still have this photograph, which was taken by the pilot I had been trying to kill. He may have thought that he owed me this memento of the day when, by the fortunes of war, we both missed death. Hall wrote that during his stay in German hospitals, I received good medical treatment and kindly personal treatment. My treatment by the Germans during all the time I was a prisoner was as good as I believe I had any right to expect. As most of you will know, after the war, Hall moved to Tahiti and became one of the most popular of American writers and novelists, along with his co-author, Charles Nordoff. 
Our next account be begins on the afternoon of 23 January 1918, when a flight of eight Sapa camels from number three squadron, Royal Naval Air Service, were conducting an offensive sweep in Belgium. When they attack were attacked, when they attacked a group of false D3s from Yasta 7. Naval Three Squadron's report stated that many indecisive combats ensued. All EA were driven down. Flight Sub-Lieutenant Ewans has not returned from patrol. The missing man was Hubert St. John Edgerly Ewans, who crash-landed in Camel B7184 near Dixmude and was taken prisoner. His opponent, Lieutenant Carl Degalau, gave this account of what ensued. Eventually, I forced my opponent to land on our side of the lines. As was our custom, we sent a car to pick him up and bring him to our airfield, where, in courteous fashion, he could spend the day with us as an honored guest. The occupant of the down Sopwith turned out to be Flight Sub-Lieutenant Yewens, a fine young man of 20 years who had his good looks temporarily marred by a bloody nose and a lovely pair of swollen black eyes caused by his rough landing. As soon as this son of Albion saw us approaching, he held out his hand in greeting and asked, was that you? Meaning the flyer who had forced him down. I confirmed his assumption and invited him to accompany us back to our airfield. Degelau related that during the ride, a depressed Yoans remarked that, your Archies are awfully good, and expressed respect for Gotha bombers as one flew overhead. This is a wonderful Steve Anderson painting and it's very appropriate. It shows Degelow's faults in combat with a Sopwith camel. The prisoner was taken to Yasta Seven's quarters at Winendale Castle and relaxed as he ate supper and drank a glass of wine at our casino, which is the officer's mess. With the help of the wine, we soon had a lively conversation going. My knowledge of English, which I had improved while in America a few years before the war, and a frequent toast appeared to help him forget the sorrow of defeat. The candles were lighted, and soon no one could tell whether we were in a German casino or an English club. Mr. Ewens then declared to us that he was musically inclined and performed rather well on the violin. Degelau then described how, as luck would have it, an eavesdropping cook informed the party that one of the Yasta's mechanics had just returned from leave with a violin. Ewan's host had it fetched and delivered to him, only to discover that one of its strings was missing. Their prisoner then surprised them by producing two sets of strings from his wallet. Degelau wrote, Mr. Ewan's busied himself stringing his fiddle, and I took my place at the piano to assist him in tuning the instrument. Within ten minutes, the international orchestra was ready to begin. And, and as the opening piece, we played the German national anthem, Deutschland über alles. To the delight of all present, my partner played the song with as much intensity of feeling as if it were God Save the King. Our guest gave us pleasure the entire evening and helped us pass the time with his musical entertainment. Eventually, we did play the British national anthem, and every German in the room stood at respectful attention as a sign of comradeship beyond the bounds of national or political affiliation. Thus, a battlefield defeat was transformed into a human victory. That evening at Castle Winendale was wonderful. It lasted until midnight, and then our guest was shown to a one-bed room with the windows boarded up, both for protection from a sudden storm and to ensure that he would be with us long enough to partake of breakfast in the morning. As a final precautionary measure, the prisoner was politely asked to part with his braces and his boots temporarily, as running barefoot while holding one's trousers up is a bit difficult. The following morning, a car from an Army interrogation unit came for our guest. He departed with fulsome praise and thanks for our comradely hospitality, as well as good wishes for his conqueror and a flattering statement about the latter's gentlemanly manner of aerial combat. And again, despite a captured airplane and pilot, Degelau was not credited with what would have been his first victory as a fighter pilot. The reason may be found in an assertion by Yoans that it was passed down from his son to his grandson, that he was adamant that he had come down due to engine failure, not by being shot down. This combined with Degelow's characterization that he had forced his opponent to land, not specifying that he had shot him down, 
and the prisoner's flattering statement about Degelau's gentlemanly manner of aerial combat leads us to surmise that Johans had indeed suffered some kind of engine failure, perhaps caused by the German Archies that he praised as awfully good. Before being recognized by Degelau as a lame duck and encouraged by him to land before he would take advantage of the situation. Indeed, Degelau was known to have forced opponents he had crippled to land instead of delivering a coup de grace on several occasions after this, and took great pride in having done so. For example, we have this photo of Degelau, now commander of Yasta 40, and his pilots entertaining two SE-5A pilots they'd shot down on 14 July 1918. Degelau wrote, I sideslipped with my dancing partner, who as the first shots hit his airplane was forced out of the fray. Apparently, the Englishman had hopes of diving back to his own lines, but that was something I did not care for, as I always enjoyed personally meeting an opponent after an aerial combat. I made my viewpoint known with a burst of machine gun fire just ahead of him. The Tommy, impressed by the gray smoke trails neatly woven across his intended escape route, turned in a direction more to my liking and then landed. As another interesting postscript, when a large celebration was planned for Degelau on the occasion of his 80th birthday on 5 January 1971, a letter was sent to England by Degelau's family inquiring about Yeoen's whereabouts, as he had been invited to the German officer's mess and entertained. And afterwards, they'd even had music together, as Mr. Yeoen's could play the violin. I tell you all this to explain that Herr Degelau has a genuine interest in meeting his former opponent, from whom he has unfortunately never heard again. However, Yowans had suffered a fatal heart attack in 1942, but his son said that he would have attended the party in his place if Degelau had not died two months before his birthday party was to be held. Our next example, on 12 August 1918, was the fifth day of the, of the British Amiens Offensive. Number 209 Squadron sent out an offensive patrol of 12 Sopwith Camels that morning. As many of you know, 209 Squadron was the unit involved in the combat which led to the death of the Red Baron Manfred von Richthofen some four months before this. One of the flight leaders on August 12th was Captain John K. Summers, a, v a skilled veteran with eight victories. Summers later recalled, those first four days of the battle were pretty hectic and we suffered quite a few casualties, both in men and machines. I had to change my machine four times in those four days and there was not time to properly test the guns on the fourth before I took off early in the morning. Walker was flying a newly arrived camel with a 140 horsepower Clerget 9BF. In this unfamiliar machine, he would encounter the Richthofen Circus. In this case, a group of Fokker D7s led by Lothar von Richthofen, the brother of the late Red Baron and a great ace in his own right with 38 victories at this point. Lothar wrote his own account of this day. I went flying with Leutnant Erich Just, Eberhard Munica, and my cousin Ulf, Wolfram von Richthofen. Arriving at the front at an altitude of 4,000 to 5,000 meters, we see it is swarming with Englishmen in every direction, only they were all a great deal higher. Suddenly, we were attacked by seven or eight Sopwith camels. I got my hands on one which was attacking one of my companions. After scarcely 20 rounds, it started to burn and disappeared into the depths, burning till it reached the ground. Leutnant Just and my cousin bagged one as well. I saw this just as I was attacked from behind by a camel. A quick turn, a somewhat longer fight now ensued, and I noticed right away that I was dealing with no novice. What is more, he was a so-called pennant man, meaning that on each wing, right and left, he carried a long pennant, usually in the national colors. The aircraft in question was always the leader's airplane. This guy flew with exceptional skill, with the result that I hardly had a decent chance to fire. As soon as I got behind him and wanted to start firing, he made a tight turn and fired on me in turn. Throughout the dogfight, we were going lower and lower. This gave me an advantage because we were quite away this side of the lines. Only 500 meters above the ground, he tried his last trick to escape me. He went into a dive, making as if he wanted to land. 
In such a case, which is considered equal to surrendering, you usually let your opponent be. I knew that old trick only too well, though, because someone had already given me the slip once in the same way. So I stayed close behind him, and sure enough, at an altitude of 10 meters, he once again tried to escape, so the chase continues. I don't have too many more cartridges, so I have to conserve them. I fire only single shots from the one machine gun that still fired. In the process, as he later told me, I shot past his ear and shot his right machine gun sight to bits. Because of that, he landed. A landing in the midst of shell holes and trenches, the likes of which I have never seen again. He was extremely lucky in doing so. His machine stood five meters behind an old trench. I then fly straight home. I climb into the car to drive over to where I had shot him down. After some searching, I find him and take him back to our airfield where, three hours after parting from his comrades from England, he sat down to a pleasant cup of tea. He stayed with us until the next morning. Captain Summers, 27 years old. Over on the other side, he'd been a group leader. He was a flight commander and he had already shot down a good number of airplanes. How many, he wouldn't say. Shortly before dinner, he got to see his machine, which had been brought over in the meantime. His machine was quite new. We didn't recognize the engine. It was then flown at our airfield, so it could be straight to, Saint to, Ger straight to Germany. And as you can see, it's already been painted with German insignia. In this way, the newest achievements of the opposing side could immediately put to good use to us. The machine showed a couple of hits, but nothing dangerous. That evening, we chatted with the Lord over a glass of wine. Among the other members of the Richthofen Circus present that evening were Heinrich Mauschaka, an ace of Jasta IV, and the celebrated Ernst Udet, who had survived the war as Germany's second highest scoring ace. Many years later, Udet also recalled the meeting and this is going to sound very familiar to some of you who watched the movie just now. Lothar von Richthofen, the Rittmeister's brother, has brought down another one. This is Udet talking. He came down nearby. At, summer, at supper, he appears at the mess with Richthofen as presented to everyone. He's a tall, lanky fellow, a bit fancy, but sporting in appearance. He affects a courteous reserve. In short, a gentleman. We talk about horses, dogs, and airplanes. We don't talk of the war. The Englishman is our guest, and we don't want to give him the impression that he's being interrogated. In the middle of the conversation, he whispers to his neighbor, then he rises and walks out. Lothar looks after him, a bit worried. Where is he going? Mauschak replies that he asked, I beg your pardon, where is the WC? In other words, the outhouse. For a moment, there's an embarrassed silence. The little hut in question is almost three minutes distant. Beyond it are the woods. It would not be difficult for an athlete to reach freedom from there. There are conflicting opinions. Mauschaka is the most enterprising. He wants to go out and stand alongside the Englishman. But Lothar disagrees. We have treated the man as our guest thus far, and he's done nothing to cast doubt on his good manners but the tension remains. After all, we are responsible for the prisoner. If he gets away, there will be hell to pay. Someone steps to the window to look after the Englishman. In seconds, six or eight of us are grouped around him. The Englishman walks across the open ground in long strides. He stops, lights a cigarette, and looks around. Immediately, all of us sink into a deep knee bend. Our hospitality is sacred, and our suspicions might offend him. He disappears behind the pine boards of the outhouse. The boards don't reach to the ground, and we can see his brown boots. This is reassuring. But Mauschaka's suspicions are awakened. Boys, he yaps. He no longer stands in his boots. He's gone over the rear wall in his stocking feet and is often gone. The Englishman reappears from behind the wall. Bent low, we creep back to our seats. And he re-enters. We talk of horses, dogs, and airplanes. I would never forgive myself for disappointing such hosts, says the Englishman, with a smile around the corner of his mouth. We thank him seriously and ceremoniously. Returning to Lothar's own account, he wrote that Summers 
was actually supposed to be sent to San Quentin by truck later that evening. I felt sorry for him because he most certainly would have had to spend the night in the open. I suggested that he give me his word of honor that he make no attempt to escape during the night. That he did, with one comment, until 9 o'clock the next morning. From that time on, he meant to avail himself of every opportunity to escape. I gave him a photograph of myself as a memento of the day. And Summers himself would later recall his words, I was well treated by the circus. After the war, Carl Degelau asserted, ours was not the only German Jagdstaffel to entertain an opposing flyer brought down without harm. Indeed, it was a custom all up and down our front. An abundance of photographs and numerous statements by Allied airmen demonstrate that Degelow's claim was absolutely true. We've just seen six examples in detail that support his assertion. There are many, many more examples, but our time is limited. Accordingly, I hope you don't mind, I will merely quickly share some additional photos with only brief summaries. The first involves Hermann Goering, of all people who on the 14th of March 1916 was piloting a Feldflieger Abteilung 25 AEG G2. This is a big three-seater. It was also manned by Julius Graf von Schaisberg Tannheim and an NCO gunner named Boya. They tangled with three French bombers and Schaisberg Tannheim managed to cripple one that Goering followed and forced to land in German territory. It was a Caudron G4 from Escadrille C6 and its crew of Gaston Delpech the pilot, and Georges Thévenin, the observer, were taken prisoner. A party celebrating the victory was held at FFA 25 Officers' Mess near Stenay, and one of its attendees, Wil Wilhelm Hübner, Jim Streckfuss, are you here? Jim actually knew Wilhelm Hübner. He reported, all of us were especially happy that they were not wounded. Here we see Goering personally handing over his two French guests to General Hans von Sveil. Walter Hörndorf, then a member of Fokkerstaffel Falkenhausen, brought down Eskadri N68's Marcel Tiergein on 10 April 1916. Two photographs attest to this French guest being welcomed to the Staffel's airfield and being shown around the airfield with uh, other members of the unit. Hundorf would go on to win the Blue Max, but was killed in a crash in September 1917. On the 2nd of August 1916, a five squadron BE-2C piloted by Captain C.W. Snook was hit by anti-aircraft fire and was limping home when it was attacked and forced to land by two Fokker Eindeckers from FFA-6. This is a picture of Snook after his capture and this photo shows him being entertained by various members of FFA-6. On the 25th of August, 1916, Martin Zonder, the commander of Yasta-1, forced down a 22-squadron FE-2B near Gutecourt. Here we see Zonder, still in his flight gear, posing with its uninjured crew, Lieutenant R.D. Walker and 2nd Lieutenant C. Smith. This is a very well-known photo. Yasta 2's Oswald Bölke brought down 32 squadrons Captain Robert E. Wilson on 2 September 1916. Bölke told his parents, I fetched Captain Wilson from the prisoner assembly place yesterday and had him for coffee in our mess, showed him our airfield. Wilson wrote home, Bölke invited me to his aerodrome the next day and entertained me in his mess, and we were photographed together. I got a very good impression of him, not only as a pilot, but also as a per person. Here we see two currently unidentified British airmen being entertained at Army Flugpark 1 with the unit's commander, Alfred Keller, seated between them. And standing at the far left is Lothar von Richthofen again, who was undergoing pilot training at AFP 1. On the 7th of May, 1917, 20 squadrons Lieutenant Martin, pilot, and Private Blake were forced down in their FE-2B by Yasta 18's Walter von bülow Botkamp. And here we have the three of them together at the Yasta 18 airfield. Caporal Luchon Peru was shot down by Yasta 14's Hans Bowski and taken prisoner on 29 May 1917. We have four photos of his stay at Yasta 14's airfield. This one shows him in conversation with his Victor Bowski. Second shows him with various members of the Yasta. 
And in this badly blemished photo, he's seen with the entire unit outside. And the fourth captures him looking somewhat horrified at the celebration held in their casino. On the 7th of June, 1917, MFJ-1's Flugmat Künstler brought down a 40-squadron Newport flown by Lieutenant J.W. Shaw. Here we see a very relaxed Shaw at MFJ-1's airfield. Yasta 5's Carl Bay poses at Bois Trancor Airfield with 2nd Lieutenant E. Schultz and 2nd Lieutenant H. Wookie, the occupants of an 11-squadron Bristol F-2B that he shot down on 17 October 1917. And he, I'm sorry, I skipped that one. This is 2nd Lieutenant G. Tambling and Sergeant W. Oregon in the company of Yasta 36 airmen in front of the remains of their 22 Squadron Bristol fighter down, down by Hans Baining on 23 August 1917. And this is Schultz and Wookie with their conqueror, Carl Bay. Here they are with the entire, all the pilots of Yasta 5. A SOP with Camel piloted by Australian No. 4 Squadron, 2nd Lieutenant Couston, was shot down by Yasta 46's Rudolf Matai on 21 February 1918. 54 Squadron, 2nd Lieutenant Connolly, was shot down by Yasta 7's Kurt Schoenfelder on 18 June 1918. He was treated for his slight wound and then hosted at Yasta 7's airfield. This wonderful photo shows Connolly arm in arm with his opponent, Schoenfelder. Second Lieutenant Hempstall, the pilot, and Lieutenant Yeomans were flying an 82 Squadron Armstrong Whitworth FK 8 when they became Joseph Jacob's 26th confirmed victory on 15 September 1918. Am I doing okay on time? Okay. Here they are with Jacob's at Yasta 7's airfield. Yasta 12's Alfred Graven forced down a DH-4 from the American 20th Aero Squadron on the 26th of September 1918. Here we see its crewman, 2nd Lieutenant Guy B. Weiser and 1st Lieutenant Glenn Richardson being attended to at the Guillermont Airfield. And here they are seated with their conqueror, Graven, at Yasta 12. We've just seen some of the many examples that were recorded along the Western Front but we have two other examples from the Middle Eastern theater. On 8 July 1917, the Australian No. 1 Squadron's Lieutenant Claude Vautin was brought down by FA-300's Gerhard Felmy, who had this picture taken of them together and dropped it onto one squadron's airfield a few weeks later. The Australian recalled that he had been entertained at FA-300's casino. And another incident, on 27 June 1918, a Bristol fighter belonging to, again, Australian No. 1 Squadron, was shot down by FA-304B's Victor Hafner. It came down with a dead pilot and a wounded observer, Lieutenant Lawrence Smith. In a 1970 interview, this is amazing, Smith recalled when asked what German aviators he met, all the members of the squadron. Captain Felmy was their CO. There was Victor Hafner, the German who shot me down, but I can't remember the other names. Felmy was very kind to me. He felt that I would be better off with their squadron than in a concentration camp, and I agreed with him. He looked after me like a Dutch uncle. There was always a German guard near with a rifle, but I never once saw the guard. It was also nicely done. They kept me there at their squadron, and every time the Turks came to claim me, the German captors would shove me down into a hole, and there I would stay, perhaps for two days. There was always food, water, and reading material. And then, after the Turks would leave, I would come up again, and we'd all go off to Haifa in the buggy. This is the buggy, a railway car powered by an aircraft engine. Finally, I attracted too much attention in Haifa. Thereafter, while on these visits, I was given a German uniform to wear. <laughs> I met old General Lehmann von Sanders, who was the commander of the entire front, Turks included. We had dinner together. He was an elderly fellow. Some of the Germans, especially the intelligence officers, spoke excellent English and appeared to be very friendly. They patted you on the back and used your first name. It was so good to hear English spoken, you had to be especially careful of what you said. 
Now, the notion of chivalry and respect between airmen of opposing sides in World War I has been greatly promoted in popular culture. Even during the war, it was commonly cited by politicians and journalists, and by the end of the war, the concept of knights of the air had already become a cliché. We all know that the air war could be just as lethal and brutal as the conflict on the ground. Yet there really were episodes of respect and courtesy shown to captured air crew. I'm going to close with one more quotation, this one from Captain Duncan Grinnell Milne, a BE-2C pilot in 16 Squadron in 1915, and Dan has both of his books in his library. On the 1st of December, he was returning from a recon long reconnaissance along with his observer Captain Strong in very poor weather. They became lost and were forced down by engine failure inside of the German lines. They managed to set fire to their BE-2C, but it didn't burn completely as you see here, and they were quickly captured. Members of a nearby German flying squadron soon arrived. Grinnell Milne later wrote, I have today no warmer a feeling of friendship, no greater a respect or admiration, no deeper an understanding of the men of the German flying corps than I had on the day of my capture, and for this very good reason that in the course of one winter's afternoon in 1915, I learnt to appreciate their qualities that no mode or trend of opinion can ever change my sentiments. They did so much more than spare our lives. They spared our pride. With fellow feeling for airmen in distress, they solaced our despair. Towards us, captives from an alien and hated race, they made no gesture of anger or of reproach. Their hands were raised but to salute us. They spoke to us not with words of triumph or wrath or scorn, but with ready sympathy for our plight. We were their enemies, British, and at their mercy, but they did not show us by words or deed that they were aware of the fact. It may have been wholly that much exaggerated comradeship of the air which linked us, but I prefer to believe that our mutual understanding ran deeper. We wore the uniforms of our respective countries, we should for different causes, but beneath all of the superficialities, we knew that we were actuated by the same motives, youth, adventure, high spirits. Those things wound up the mainspring of life. So may it have been in the days of chivalry. Thank you very much. We have a, cup, we have a couple of minutes if uh, anyone has any questions. Yes, Carl. Carl, I made everybody else come down. <laughs> I'll make sure I can hear him. So in the slide that you had of Ewan's? Of, yeah. Yeah, of Ewan's? Mm -hmm. He's I'm wearing not sure a coat. That's a, what? He's wearing a coat. Yeah. That coat is not the coat he flew in. Did the Germans give him that coat? Probably, yeah. yeah. That's chivalry. Sometimes they did take coats away from their prisoners and other things, but generally they treated them very well. And uh, yes. Yeah, do we know where uh, Lothar von Richthofen went ahead and down uh, J John K. Summers? Where? Where? Mm -hmm. um, I can look it up, but I'm sure We're it's We're looking recorded. for where Lothar downed who? John Summers. John Summers. <laughs> Had to be near him, yeah. But I'm just kind of curious. The microphone. So please leave your Thank you. Sorry, I did that last time. Sorry, guys. I was looking for where uh, uh, Lothar von Richthofen downed uh, uh, John K. Summers. John K. Summers. Still doesn't work. Hello. Wow, you got to be right up on this thing. Uh, you made that uh, presentation on John, on John K. Summers. Wow, I'm bad with the mic. Anyway, I was just kind of curious if we knew where he landed. Where roughly. he landed. Um, it was fairly close within the German lines, but uh, I don't, it was, their airfield was at Bern, B-E-R-N-E-S, and it was right. not far from there. I can look it up and see okay. it. Uh, Lothar's probably had a location, but right. I don't know it offhand. I'm sorry. I'd appreciate that. And uh, also, you mentioned the word concentration camp. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, it's the word he used, the pr this man used. Uh, it referred to a Turkish prisoner of war camp, which was, which was no picnic, I'm sure. 
Yeah, I've, uh, I've got a very limited edition print uh, of a French soldier who drew from the inside of a camp. Uh, and you know what? For 1917, it sure did look like a concentration yeah. camp. So yeah. I was just kind of curious if the officers went back uh, into something like that because the one shot you had of uh, a couple of English uh, officers, they looked like they were in pretty decent shape. Yeah. So I, I was wondering if maybe because they were, you know, because that passed on to the Second World War also. Yeah. The, you know, yeah. I mean, they, they never had each other. enough food because Germany was blockaded. Um, and in, in, the, in, in the Middle East, you know, I, I'm sure Turkish prison camps were, were terrible. But um, uh, just curious. So like I said, yeah. I just happened to have that, uh, it, it, those drawings. So anyway, thank you. Uh, a, a couple more, but then we've got an announcement and we need to keep on time at the end because people need to get going. So two more quick, please. <laughs> the examples that you used all seem to be over the front. Would the attitude be different if the pilot was down after you know a bombing raid over a civilian target or what was considered more a civilian target? I'm sorry, can you, re can you repeat that? Sure. Um, they've got, your examples all seem to be at right the at the front. front. Mm -hmm. So if the pilot had been downed over, you know, say a city that was being bombed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, dirigibles or anything else, yeah. You know, yeah. would the attitude be completely different? Well, it, it varied according to the situation. Um, if you'd just been bombed, uh, quite, <laughs> quite often they weren't really friendly, but, um, but I have heard of, of Handley Page, all 400 crews that were downed on bombing raids. And if they got past the civilians, uh, they were generally treated okay by the military. You know. Based on the experiences of the British POWs at Coote, most yeah. of the officers survived and were halfway decently treated. Enlisted men, badly treated, a lot of them died. Yeah. Also, the National World War I Museum Memorial has a presentation dealing with the German Army coming home in the West, like 12 November to December 1918. Mm. Okay, thanks. If you'll indulge me for just a minute, I think you might be interested to hear uh, if Andrew Ferry, are you uh, are you still here? Did you want to say a couple of words about? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I think you might be interested in this. Uh, Andrew's visiting from England, and he's been on a couple of month whirlwind tour of aviation sites. <laughs> Uh, hello, first of all, thank you. It's a, it's a great privilege and, and pleasure to be actually be able to be with you guys. I've read a lot of your names on the backs of books and things for the last few decades, and, and, and as I say, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I'm you. sure a lot of you know about um, uh, this, the League Sister Organization in the UK, which has gone under a, a variety of names. Um, it's recently be, been renamed the Great War Aviation Society. Prior to that, it was... Damn. Cross and Cockade, um, and uh, from the name you'll recognise, it was originally a split off from the original U.S. Cross and Cockade in the in the in the 1960s. Um, but essentially, it's still the same organisation. Um, I myself, part of the reason I've had the time to do this travelling is that I, I'm now pretty much retired um, as of this year. Uh, and um, one of the other things that I've been able to do is to get more involved with the Great War Aviation Society. Um, I now uh, am part of the team that organizes uh, our online lecture program, which uh, some of you may or may not have uh, attended in the past. Um, but I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about those because they're, they're online. Um, obviously, um, you guys are all free to get involved. Um, they happen about once every month. Um, the next one is due on uh, November the 18th. Um, they are free to members and also to subscribers for the uh, um, society's e-newsletter. And um, a subscription to the e-newsletter is also free, so 
Uh, if you get one, you can get access to the uh, online lectures um, without any payment at all. Um, so you may be interested to hear that the next one, which is on the 28th of November, um, they all happen at um, 8 o'clock in the evening um, UK time, so that'll be sometime in the afternoon. Uh, yeah, depending on which, 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 which part of the country you're yeah, here, here it would be, yeah. Um, so um, I, I don't know if you're aware that there's a filmmaker called Daniel Arbon who for the last um, year or so has been making a short film about uh, Lenu Hawker uh, and in particular uh, dramatizing um, the day in July 1915 when he um, uh, shot down an aircraft with his Bristol Scout and through that earned his Victoria Cross. Anyway, that, that movie is now complete as of uh, really just the last few days. Um, and uh, on our next lecture on the 28th of November, um, there will be a showing of that movie and uh, a discussion with the director. Um, so, I mean, that's I, I've seen some, some shots of the movie. It looks amazing. It's a mixture of um, live action and, and uh, special effects. And the... The live action part makes a lot of use of um, David Bremner's uh, Bristol Scout um, reconstruction, uh, which, uh, I again, you may have come across. Um, it, 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 if you'll forgive me a minute or two, it's a, it's a, a fascinating story. His grandf David Bremner's grandfather was a Bristol Scout pilot with the Royal Naval Air Service in, uh, in the Dardanelles in 1915, and he brought back as souvenirs from... 1264, which was his favourite Bristol Scout, a German magneto that he had that they had uh, captured and fitted to the aircraft, and the rudder bar. And from this, David, uh, who is a, a, an airplane builder and pilot, decided that he was going to build a replica aircraft, and he's done done that, and it's been uh, flying on the on the uh, UK air show circuit for the last uh, three or four years. So um, that was the aircraft that has starred in the movie as, as Lenu Hawker's um, uh, Bristol Scout. Um, so that'll be a fantastic one. And the, the, the one after that in December, which the date hasn't been settled, um, is your very own John Gutman, who is talking about um, breaking racial barriers in the RFC, which also sounds like an interesting story. Um, so um, that's what we know so far. There will be more talks in early in the new year as well. Um, I hope you'll be able to come along and, and get involved. Thanks. Th thank you, Andrew. Uh, and if you haven't seen Cross and Cogate International, which is still the name of the journal, uh, by all means, you should check that out. I should just say it's also still the name of the website. So if you need any of the details yep. of the lecture program, how to subscribe to Wind in the Wires, which is the e-newsletter, just go to www.crossandcockade.com. Yep. Or for us, overthefront.com. Uh, you're not going to want to miss the last session. Uh, we ran a little later for, for Greg and for uh, Andrew there, but I think that's great information. Thanks, Greg, for that great presentation. Let's take a quick break and try to be back at 3.20. You're not going to want to miss Mark Levitch talking about the Pantheon. <laughs>